Hello, Terry. Good morning. How are you guys doing? We are doing well. How are you? Good, man. Real good. Yeah, it's a shame you guys are so far away. Otherwise, I would have just driven out there and talked to you. Yeah, I thought it would be a, a, something maybe we could set up in the future for a future class. Maybe we can take a bus and spend a couple days to see you. Sure, whatever you want. That'd be fun. Wouldn't be a bad time. If it's a couple days, I'd, I'd swing the trip out there, too, if you guys got a good place to go. Yeah, that's a problem. We don't have that many good places to go around here. Don't you? We have a lot of just flat farm ground. Oh, we have yeah. some we have some state parks, but they're they're pretty small. Right. Yeah. yeah we got all the hills up here. It's pretty nice up yeah. on those hills. Yeah. How far away from Omaha are you? I'm uh, about uh, 35 minutes or so. OK, so I'm not far from the Missouri River. And then we got the hills that just run all through everything. So it's sure. pretty nice. Yeah. Really nice area. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll go ahead and explain uh, what our class is. We, uh, every, uh, for the past couple of years, we took the last year off because of the whole COVID stuff. Sure. But um, we have one week where we do a standalone class where we don't do the regular content of the school. And it's, uh -huh. it's kind of a, a little mental break type of deal. And sure. so each teacher gets to pick what they want to do. And I chose Wilderness Survival a couple of years ago, and it's been pretty popular. So we've just been um continuing that so that's great it's uh you know it's kind of a camping skills wilderness survival basic and sure. so we uh so far what we've done is we've made some of our own knives so i'm the shop teacher so we have all those tools we've made our own knives we've uh um i plasma cut it out some hatchets little hatchets and we've heat treated those sharpened those and then we spent half a day out in the woods making some basic structures and starting some fires with uh, ferro rods and sure. that type of stuff. That's great. That's great. I'm glad your school lets you do that. That's very important. Yeah, it's a lot of fun. We we really yeah. enjoy it. That's awesome. And how old are these are, the, are these guys that do this? This is uh, seventh through eleventh uh, grade. Oh, that's great. Perfect age. Perfect. Yeah. So, um, could you tell us a little bit about your background, how you got into bushcrafting and doing the whole survive the wild type sure. stuff? You bet. So, uh, when I was younger, when I was about these guys' age, I started in Boy Scouts. Um, now, today, Boy Scouts is a lot different than it used to be, you know, which is fine. It is what it is. Um, but I was able to uh, go camping a lot. My troop was very active with, as far as camping. I grew up in Ohio. So I grew up kind of in Northern Ohio, um, and there's a lot of places to go up there, a lot of uh, things to do. So my troop would go camping all the time, and we planned a trip up to Minnesota to the uh, Charles L. Summers Canoe Base up in uh, Ely, Minnesota. So we did a trip up there, and I absolutely loved it, and I inquired on what I could do to work there, and they said, well, put your application in, and we'll see what happens. And I got hired three days out of high school. I was on the road and uh, I moved to Minnesota uh, for that summer. And I canoed probably about uh, eight, 900 miles that summer. And uh, I was all over in the Quetico and the Boundary Waters up there. Uh, after that, they, they hired me on for their winter program. And uh, we went out there at 40 below weather. We'd spend the night out there. Um, I had some really great mentors. One was named Tom Luchens, and he was a survival instructor in the Air Force uh, for many years. He taught at the Jungle School. He taught in Alaska. He taught all over. And he was a great mentor to me. Also, uh, I, had, I was able to learn some stuff from Morris Kohansky. He came down and taught uh, some of us at the canoe base um for a couple weeks which was a very eye-opening experience I don't, i'm sure you're familiar with morris kohansky right uh you know just by name i haven't read read anything right. of him or your audio i got i've got no audio on you buddy sorry i forgot to unmute that's okay um i just you heard of morris just heard of him i haven't done any yeah. reading on him so if if you uh ever in the uh um market to get a book just get the one called bushcraft by morris kohansky it's a phenomenal book um and uh he was a very he was a good man and he ended up dying of uh, mesothelioma 
a uh, year before last, I believe. But anyway, after that, my one of my mentors, Tom Lucians, he talked me into going into the military and becoming a, a survival instructor in the military. And I was like, deal, I'm in. So there I got to go all over the country. And once again, I learned from some of the best people. Uh, I got to teach in Alaska a little bit, uh, Washington State. Um, we went down in the deserts. Uh, so I was all over. Um, after that, I got out of the military and uh, I became a firefighter in Omaha, Nebraska. And uh, in between that time, I would still teach on and off. And then probably about 10 years ago, I got um, involved in um, a company called uh, 88 Tactical um, in Omaha. And they have a big property up in Tecama, Nebraska. And I teach up there a few times a year now. I did for a while, I did some traveling teaching. Um, Indiana, North Carolina, um, just anybody that wanted me to come out, I'd travel out and teach. Uh, but that got kind of old after a while. You know, there, and, and contrary to popular belief, there's not a lot of money in uh, teaching survival. You're going to you're gonna suffer. You know what I mean? It's, it's rough, especially in economic times are hard. And people don't have extra money. They're going to buy other stuff as opposed to paying for training. So it's, uh, it, it, but it's a lot of fun, but as, as a side gig, it's good. You know, and that's kind of my uh, my history in a nutshell there. OK, well, thanks so much for sharing that. We have some questions for you. Um, I'll let these gentlemen right here ask the first question. All right. Uh, what's the longest time you spent out in the like wilderness? Oh, like without coming back to civilization? Oh, probably two and a half weeks or so, something like that. <laughs> yeah, right around in there. What was the hardest part about that, being so long out there? Um, It wasn't hard at all. It was awesome. <laughs> I don't uh, – very rarely do I have poor memories of doing things like that. You know, it, it's usually a little bit of getting older, too. You don't remember the bad times. But uh, um, I really uh, enjoyed – every second of being out in the woods at that time and i found um there to be so much to explore even from the smallest areas that you could go to to the great big wide open spaces and was, i just enjoyed it a lot yeah great let's see merrick can your group ask a question yeah hey uh what was one of your weirdest meals you ever had <laughs> uh, <laughs> so when i was going through um training in the air force I wouldn't call this a meal is more like a hazing thing, but in the Pacific Northwest out in the whole rainforest, uh, they have what's called banana slugs. And, uh, we were, uh, encouraged to eat banana slugs, right? So these things, uh, they're only defense mechanism. You can look them up too, and they can be up to like six inches long. They're monsters. And their only uh, defense is to secrete mucus. So, uh, you'd have to, you threw it in your mouth and you chew it up and it immediately started uh, secreting mucus in your mouth. It goes down your throat. It gags you. The only thing that'll really take it away is either citrus or uh, really strong salt water. And uh, so obviously we didn't have any citrus because we were out in the field. And uh, so you just drank a lot of really strong salt water to try to wash out, which obviously made you throw up too because you can't drink salt water. So uh, that was the strangest and probably most awful meal I've ever had. All right, thank you. You're welcome, buddy. All right, Mason, how about your group? Can you ask a question? Um, what are your favorite tools to use in the uh, woods? So the two tools that uh, I, I very rarely go to the woods without, uh, number one is uh, a small knife, uh, fixed blade, uh, Scandinavian grind, I prefer because it's easier to sharpen and I think it's easy to maintain. I like 1095 steel. I don't get crazy about stuff. I don't, I have to reinvent the wheel. A Mora knife is just fine. Um, and a fire steel, a ferrocenium, ferrocenium rod. Uh, I've learned how to start fires with that and um, just about any condition I can get a fire going in that. So if I have a knife and a way to make fire, uh, I'm pretty happy. Most other things you can you can work with, right? But it's, it's hard to recreate a knife in the field, and it's even harder to uh, get fire going 
and austere conditions. Um, I'm not a big proponent of like friction fire. Uh, if you look back in the annals of uh, survival situations that people have actually lived in, very there's only one that I can remember right off the top of my head that a guy actually got a friction fire going, and it was in Vietnam, and it was a bamboo uh, fire saw, and he barely got it going. And it, it, I'm just not a big proponent of stuff like that. So a knife and a fire steel are definitely the two things that uh, I would take to the woods. <laughs> All right, Cameron, do you have a question? What is your favorite type of shelter to build? Oh, to build or to stay in? I'll start with build first. So to build, if I'm going to build a shelter out in the field that I know I'm going to be staying in, it's probably going to be an open face lean-to with a long fire in front of it. Um, I have spent the night out in below freezing weather in a shelter like this and it will reflect heat back on you as long as you have a good insulation bed um and it's not comfortable and you'll sleep for about an hour at a time but it's better than no sleep at all and uh it works pretty well that's usually going to be with obviously with natural materials right with boughs or branches or debris whatever you can get you just have to be careful you don't light it on fire obviously um non-natural shelter is going to be my sill nylon eight-man teepee with a titanium wood-burning stove in it is, is the cat's meow. I've slept in a lot of really bad places, but having a wood-burning stove inside a teepee that weighs about 11 pounds is an awful nice thing. It's really nice. All right, Ty, can your group ask a question? Would you rather have a ferro rod or would you rather have a lighter when you go out? 100% ferro rod. I'm a ferro rod guy. I've had lighters fail in the field. And there'll be people that argue with you up and down. And I think it's a personal choice. Some people have had great luck with lighters. I have not. If you stomp on a lighter, it's broken. Um, they're harder to lanyard off your body. Uh, so you don't lose them. They, um, when they're wet, they don't work great. And with really cold fingers, they don't work awesome either. Personal choice, right? I, I take a ferro rod every day. All right, gentlemen, you guys got another question? Um, what's your favorite kindling to use? Um, okay, so this is kind of a, it, de it depends on where you're at, right? So if I'm in the North Woods or somewhere south where there's a, a prevalent uh, coniferous uh, forest, right? A, a cone bearing trees, pine trees. Uh, a lot of times if they're injured, you can have it get fat wood, pitch wood, whatever you want to call it. Um, and that is by far one of the best things you can use to start a fire. Now, if I'm in a primary deciduous uh, uh, forest, then I'm going to want something uh, that is dry, dead standing, about wrist thick if I can get it, um, that I can take down very easily. I don't need an ax to do it. I can break it into manageable pieces. I can baton it down and I can get the dry wood from the middle of it. Um, and in areas where there's not a lot of uh, uh, pitch wood, sometimes you can get cedars like Eastern red cedars um, and those work, or, or I'm sorry, Western red cedars. And those work really well as, as well. So it would probably be uh, pitch wood, Fatwood, whatever you want to call it, would be my favorite. And then um, Western Cedar. And then if we get into deciduous forests, um, you know, mulberry works really, really good. And it's a really prevalent tree around here. So those would probably be my top three right there. As far as kindling. Now, as far as fire, fire starters, that's a different, different deal, right? So you said mulberry? You like that yeah. for kindling? So like the little tiny parts of it? So or? mulberry mulberry is a great tree uh, around here. Number one, is it's a great resource tree, right? So it's, it's easy to identify because it has a very predominant uh, twig structure, and uh, it has those little berries on it, right? All the animals eat mulberries. Coons, possums, you know, birds, everybody eats mulberries. You can eat mulberries. They're great because they're an aggregate berry. 100% of aggregate berries are edible. So um, that's a great thing to know. But you cut it down, you split it. It usually splits really nice. It seasons very well. It works very well 
for uh, kindling. So I'm just talking like split wood fires too, right? I'm, I'm a big proponent of being able to learn how to split wood. If you know how to split wood and break it down in your proper sizes, you're going to have no trouble getting wood uh, fire going with twigs. So if you always prepare yourself for the worst, it's easier to uh, perform with easier materials. All right, Merrick, does your group have another question? Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, what was your most and dangerous encounter? <laughs> most dangerous encounter. You mean like with wildlife or like falling off a cliff or like stuff like that? What, what, what expound a little bit, my friend? <laughs> um, probably just an overall, just the most dangerous, what you see as the most, whatever it would be. Okay. So. I, I know you're probably, I, I've run into grizzlies in the, in the woods and stuff like that before. Right. But, uh, my big thing on that is just stay away. Right. I've run into bear cubs and things like that. Um, to be honest, probably looking back, some of the worst situations I've been in is, um, when it's about 32 degrees and it's raining and snowing at the same time and you get soaked. Those, if you look through articles, if you look through um, history, becoming hypothermic is one of the worst things that can happen to you, right? And I've been hypothermic before. Um, I was actually during our training, they made us get hypothermic. We were um, on the uh, Olympic Peninsula and they would strip us down into our shorts and submerge us in cold water. And until you started getting hypothermic, and then they'd throw you a pocket knife and a fire steel, and uh, they wanted you to get a fire going. Now, luckily, I was always good enough to get it going, or lucky enough, whatever it was. And uh, but I saw some of my companions and, and friends and during training that couldn't get a fire going because they got so hypothermic. So hypothermia is one of those things when I look back and I've seen crews that I've taken to the woods, and I I look back and I and experience has taught me that. Uh, those are some of the most dangerous times you can get into. It's cold, wet, uh, no way to dry out. That's 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 what'll get you. All right, Mason, do you have another question? What do you enjoy most about learning survival? Uh, wilderness survival. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's see what I enjoy the most. When I was younger, I enjoyed the challenge of it. I was, um, always looking for something that was like on the edge, always trying to push myself as far as I could. Like I would, I, when I was in Minnesota, I would, I would, sleep out in 40 below degree weather with no shelter right that was kind of i was i was on just i really wanted to challenge myself so when i was younger it was the challenge that the wilderness provided um rock climbing you know all that stuff i i i enjoyed the uh, the danger aspect of it the, the challenge of it um now i'm older and uh i've slowed down a lot because that's what happens when you get older. You guys will find that out. Um, <laughs> now, what I enjoy most, and this sounds a little goofy, but I like going out and looking at plants in different seasons and learning some of the uh, the folklore on the plants and the um, the different uses. And I like being, it, I get a charge now instead of being in danger. I get a charge out of being able to look at a plant and uh, know exactly what it is and know what it can be used for and historically what it's been used for. So not very exciting, but that's kind of what I get in charge out of these days. So along those lines, do you do a lot of the wild food foraging? You know, I, for a long time, I did a lot. I tried a lot. I ate a lot. I um, experimented. I did different things. 
now it's just more of an identification thing for me. <sighs> Excuse me. Um, I do like in this area, since I've been here so long, I've been, I've become, I've know I know like a lot of all the basic stuff. Right. And now it's like, and I've tasted most of it. I've prepared most of it. Like, uh, I'll give you an example. Um, wood nettles, right? There's two types of nettles that grow around. There's stain nettle and wood nettle, and they're very different. Wood nettles, when they're young, and they're about six inches off the ground, um, you can pick them, and they snap right off at the ground level. Um, you can uh, heat them up real quick in a little bit of butter, and they taste exactly like broccoli. They're phenomenal. And they have a ton of vitamins in them, and they're really good for you. Uh, that I enjoy stuff like that, that I can learn like uh, wild ramps or, or leaks, right? Um, easy. And I know now when everything grows and mushrooms and stuff like that, mushrooms are one of the more difficult ones, obviously, because they can really mess you up. Most plants don't mess you up. I mean, there's like, like pulkweed, um, you know, you can make a pulkweed, you can eat the young shoots, but when it gets older, it's poisonous because it builds up toxins in it. That's the kind of stuff that I think people need to learn. But if you learn the basics that grow like everywhere, nettles grow everywhere. Broadleaf plantain, which is also used to be called soldier's herb, grows everywhere. Yarrow. So like the Roman soldiers, they were required to carry uh, in their in their pouches for medicinal purposes, stinging nettle, uh, plantain, and yarrow, right? And it covers a lot of bases, analgesics. Um, uh, pain relievers, uh, anti-inflammatories, they have a lot of really great uses, um, just those three herbs right there. So, yeah, that's the kind of stuff that interests me now, the historical uses and stuff like that. Native Americans, what they use certain things for too, you know. But but with that, um, I, I've read a lot of books on that, right? And I'll, like an example is they say uh, blackberry leaves are supposed to help menstrual cramps. Well, guess what? I don't have menstrual cramps. I don't know anything about that. It's hard for me to test it, right? But if you read books, they repeat it like time after time after time after time. But I've never seen anybody actually say, hey, I tried this and used it. So I find that interesting too, how a lot of books um, can repeat themselves like almost like a parakeet, right? You know? So anyway, I ramble. I, I forget. But forgive me. <laughs> no, that's good. We uh we we don't ha have near the um, wealth of knowledge that you have. So anything that you're anything like rabbit trails are still good trails in my opinion. So. <laughs> right. I agree. Right. So Cameron, do you have a question you can ask? What's the most important thing you've learned? Oh, man. That's a pretty broad question, Cameron. Um, okay. The most important thing I think I've learned through my own experience and through reading what has happened to people is being prepared. Most people who get into wilderness survival, who get into... Um, the outdoors, most people are prepared for it. And if they're not, then they learn through experience real quick. So being prepared, having the right equipment with you. There's a lot of people that will teach, um, and I'm not opposed to any of this, don't get me wrong, but there's a lot of places that'll teach like, well, you can do a hand drill to make a fire, you can do a bow drill, you can do this, you can do that. Uh, all these different techniques, you can make a, a, a knife out of a rock and you can use this. That's all great. But in today's day and age, if you're going out in the woods and you're not prepared to go out in the woods, you're probably going to be in trouble. Um, so being prepared, having the proper gear with you at all times, having some sort of uh, knife, some way to start a fire, a way to collect and contain water, um, uh, a way to put up a quick shelter, things like that are are probably in my mind the most important things and that's what gets people through tight spots it's not rubbing two sticks together i can tell you that much you know it, it repeatedly you can look at people that have gone through these situations and they almost always are, are relying on gear that they have and if not they're they're in trouble and i'll give me an example so when i was um in the military we did a lot of search and rescue stuff out in the mountains so there was this during elk season, there's this guy that uh, had a license plate up in Idaho. His license plate was called Frosty One. 
and he always wore a t-shirt out. He never wore a coat and everybody thought that was great. Right. So he goes out and he's actually an elk poacher and he goes out and he shoots an elk and he gets out of his vehicle and he starts tracking it. Well, all he has is a t-shirt on <laughs> nothing else with him. Maybe a knife. I think might be, he might have had in a book of matches. So he starts tracking his elk. Well, nobody sees him for a day or so and they find his truck and they found some tracks and then it started to snow and they found an area where he had holed up in like a a great big pine tree that um, had been rotten out and he tried to start a fire. You could see all the matches that were dead and and that he tried to start a fire with. Um, And he wandered off. We searched for him for two days, ended up snowing five foot on us in two days. And uh, obviously we couldn't find him. They found him later in the spring um, down in a ravine and he was obviously passed away, but uh, he didn't have anything with him and he was arrogant. And that's probably what, what got him, you know, was not having any equipment. So having that equipment with you is very, very important. So along those lines, what are your top five items? If you had, you had a pack and you had just mm-hmm. enough time to grab five items and then you're going to be thrown in the woods for an indefinite amount of time. What would your top five items be? <laughs> Obviously a knife is going to be one fire steel sleeping bag tarp and it's going to have to be a water container. Now, if I had one other item besides that, and this may sound a little silly, but a cell phone, right? So what, what I don't think some of you guys understand is that there is such a vast amount of knowledge that you can gain from these little computers in your pockets. And when I was growing up, obviously we didn't have this and I'll give you an example. Um, when I was younger, I was obsessed at learning how to start a bow and drill fire, right? All I had were books, nobody to teach me because nobody knew it was, it was, it's very common skill right now. And that's because the internet, but back in the day, it was not a common skill at all. Nobody, as far as wilderness survival goes, nobody knew how to do it. And I was finally learned when I was about 20 years old from Tom Luchens, he taught me how to do it. Um, But now you can get some of the most amazing um, instructions on how to do 90% of this stuff out there. And it's just a wonderful resource and just the the knowledge is endless. And once you start learning it and trying stuff, you can kind of sift out uh, the people that know what they're doing and the people that don't know what they're doing. But uh, it's, it, it comms is a big deal having communications, right? But if it was top five, it'd have to be knife fire steel, a tarp, um, a sleeping bag, and a water container. All right, very good. Let's see. Ty, do you have another question? Uh, What's your favorite, like, boot brand that you would wear out in the wild? Oh, boots? (laughs) Now, that's, that's a good question. So, for... Back in the day, uh, I got issued um, Fort Lewis Danners, and they're a great big heavy-duty boot that were Gore-Tex lines, and we wore them all the time. I still have two pair of them that I've bought over the years. Uh, Super solid boot. For most of what you do, though, I I like uh, Solomon boots, um, Gore-Tex lines. And then with a pair of Gore-Tex gaiters over the top of them, it keeps a lot of stuff from beating up your boots. Boots are expensive, man. You get what you pay for, too. Uh, There used to be a lot of really good brands of boots, and now I think it's kind of it's getting whittled down to just a few. Everything's built so cheaply anymore. and I've even had trouble with Solomon's and and Danner's every once in a while. Um, But... Yeah, those and they're expensive, man. God, they're so expensive. I like a pair of boots, a pair of Danners that I have is like 300 bucks. That's crazy, right? Um, the Solomons that I wear, I wear Solomons every day. Um, I have for years. Um, you're usually a couple hundred bucks for a pair of boots, you know. 
um, the shoes, the hikers are, you know, 150 or so ish. So yeah, Solomon's and Danner's my favorites. And, if, and for a pack boot, like Sorrell's and a pack boot, what I'm talking about a pack boot is it's, a, it's like an outer boot. And then uh, like a felt and wool liner that slides in them. Sorrell's are, used to be a real good brand. I don't know so much anymore, but I wore a Sorrell's a lot too out in the, uh, up in Minnesota in the wintertime. So along those lines, are there certain things that you say absolutely spend the money at this section and then don't spend the money over here to where you can get by on the cheap? Is there certain categories or different things you can think of that way? Yeah, I think um, protective wear as far as rain gear, boots, uh, spend the money on it. You don't get good Gore-Tex stuff that's been tested. Outdoor Research is a good brand. Um, I I really like like Climashield Apex type stuff. Um, Kifaru, Kifaru, however you want to say it, they make some really solid stuff. Um, it's expensive. God, it's expensive, but it's nice. Um, Hill People Gear makes some good stuff. Um, but yeah, boots, outerwear is important, super important. Like a knife, you can use just a, a $15 Mora for years and years and years. I have a Mora 511 that was given to me by Lars Falt, who was the, um, he was a colonel in the Swedish military and he, he gave it to me when he came and visited the survival school. He's written several books, um, He's, uh, he's a very knowledgeable guy, but I've had that knife. I still have it. I've cleaned tons of animals with it. I've split tons of wood with it. I've just, and it's just a small little knife, you know, um, but it works great, but knives are pretty easy to get by with, with a cheaper option. Um, let me think. <sighs> Packs. I like kit through packs. They're bomb proof. Um, shelter material, man, a good tarp will last for years. I actually part owner and bushcraft outfitters and we sell tarps. And one of the reasons that I started doing it was because there was a lack of what I considered good tarps out there. Um, that's what I carry and use hammocks. I like, um, Oh, God dang it. War Bonnet. I have a, one of their bridge hammocks that is just phenomenal. Uh, teepees. I like Seek Outside. They make some really good products. Um, outdoor Research for Gators, Gore-Tex Coats. <sighs> Let's see. Yeah, right off the top of my head, I can't think of a whole lot else. But, you know, there's... There's a lot of stuff that you can do um, that doesn't cost a lot of money, like fire starters, right? Vaseline and cotton balls in a small container. They're your friends. That's phenomenal. 550 cord. You can get 550 cord dirt cheap, and it works great for all kinds of stuff. You don't need anything fancy, you know? Um, that's a, a really common item to have is 550 cord, right? It works great. Uh, let's see what else. Right off the top of my head, I can't think anything super special. There's a lot of stuff out there that's real gimmicky, right? Um, and unfortunately, there's a lot of people that are like used car salesmen and, and they'll do all these commercials and they'll have all these people that'll be all like, this is the best, these influencers, right? Um, but a lot of it's not that great. Like, uh, Nalgene stainless steel bottles, um, a single wall. Those are great. If you want to spend a lot of money, you can get heavy cover titanium stuff. That's great, but super expensive. Um, yeah, that's about it for that kind of stuff. All right, good to know. Let's see. Uh, Mason, do you have another question? Uh, no. Okay. What about Cameron, do you have <laughs> on, any Mason. other questions? 
No, there's no questions. Ty, do you have any more? Would you rather have a knife or a hatchet when you go out in the field? Um, so for me, it would be a knife. Um, there's, uh, there's debate about that, right? But I know what I can do with a knife and I, the fine work with a hatchet is, is rough, right? Um, a fine, fine work with a knife is a lot easier. And I have techniques that I can do for taking down small trees. Like I know like shows like alone and, um, TV shows, I think have changed people's opinions on some stuff. Like they build these cabins and, and stuff like that. Right. We got to remember alone isn't a survival show. It's an endurance contest, right? Anytime you can press a button and be evacuated from an area, or if you get hurt or get a boo-boo or your belly doesn't feel good, right? That's not survival. That's endurance. That's what you can put yourself through. Now I'm not, don't get, I'm, don't, I'm not trying to belittle people that do this. Don't get me wrong. I know several people that have been on it. Joe Robinet, um, who was on it the first season, Joe's a friend of mine. He was a student of mine years ago. And uh, I talk to Joe all the time. But I do know that it, it's a contest, right? It's a contest to win money. So when you see all these guys out there with their big axes and big saws and stuff like that, that's great. But they're trying to build themselves a shelter that they can stay in for an extended amount of time and, and try to stay warm and just hunker down. Now, true survival, you always have to remember that true survival isn't how long you can stay out there. It's how quick you can get rescued. So there's there's a big difference between survival and endurance um endurance is, is a contest survival is not a game you need to get out of there and most of the time in, in these survival quote-unquote situations you're going to be injured as well right so swimming in a hatchet is is kind of rough to do if you're injured especially if, if one arm is injured or a leg is injured right it's a lot easier to manipulate a knife than it is a hatchet so for, for more multi-purpose use, I would prefer a knife for sure. All right, Merrick, do you have any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, what do you recommend the most in a med kit? Uh, med kit. So I uh, just based on I was a paramedic for 25 years, um, and I've seen a lot of trauma, gunshot wounds, stabbings, um, horrible vehicle wrecks, right? I've, I've, I've been around the block. So for immediate, immediate life-saving um, equipment in a, in a first aid kit, a tourniquet, and I like North American Rescue, and learn how to use the tourniquet, right? And uh, a compression dressing, which is going to be used in an area where you can't get um, a tourniquet on, so someplace it's not your limbs, right? Um, after that, uh, steri strips, and this is, this isn't just like paramedic stuff. This is just like stuff I've learned over the years. I like steri strips a lot, a way to clean wounds, um, stitches in the field are a bad idea. All you're doing is poking more holes in yourself and introducing other places for, uh, infection to get in. And most of the time, um, like people that show how to do stitches and things like that. I've had lots of stitches, lots, and I've never not been able to control bleeding on a small cut that took like a dozen stitches or so. Um, so it, it, it you're just going to have a scar. It'll heal up eventually. Right. So stitches are out. Um, as far as medications go, ibuprofen, um, diphenhydramine, which is Benadryl. So allergic reactions, um, are, are a rough thing to deal with in the field. Uh, you can do epinephrine, uh, like an epi shot, right? Like a uh, auto injector, but you have to kind of know what you're doing. Um, so diphenhydramine is a great way to, to deal with allergic reactions. Um, Imodium uh, to stop diarrhea because dehyd dehydration will get you. Uh, iodine, which is good for cleansing wounds, and also you can use it to purify water. Um, let me see good band-aids like cloth high strength band-aids don't get the cheap walmart junk right um 
let's see what else do i carry in my stuff um uh, there's some pretty cool stuff little soap uh wafers right they you see the summit used to make these and they're like they're great just for cleaning up um this is a weird one that, that that's really hard to replicate um toenail clippers right and i know it sounds dumb but it's hard to replicate toenail clippers in the field like if you get a hangnail or um an ingrown toenail or something in the field a pair of toenail clippers is the best thing to fix that um let's see what else do i carry in there i like iodine prep pads and they're good for starting fires if you have to as well um i usually carry an occlusive dressing of some sort which is like for puncture wounds to the chest and that's just because of my experience and the stuff that i've seen um oh Sudafed. Sudafed's a good one um, because not only uh, can it like clear up any of your sinuses or, or it dries up mucous membranes, it will also um, drive away hunger. So you can take a few Sudafed and uh, it keeps you from getting hungry. Um, and obviously don't grab all this stuff until you talk to your parents, right? This is like, you know what I'm saying? Some of it can get a little dicey sometimes. Um, let's see, what else do I keep in one of my kits? I think that's about it, right off the top of my head. Basic stuff, right? But, but a big thing with it, oh, triangular bandages. Triangular bandages are huge, man. You can use them to sling and swath arms. Um, you can use them to, um, help splint. Sam splints are another good one too from North American Rescue. They're great. I've used those in the field quite a bit. Um, but yeah, that's so Sam splints, triangular bandages, tourniquet, pressure dressing. That's like your, your big ones for immediate injury. And then just those list of medications, some good band aids, a way to clean up, toenail clippers. So nothing too crazy. That's a good question, though. All right. Do you guys have any other questions? Uh, what's your favorite location that you've camped at? Oh, that's a good question. So up in the Quetico, about 12 miles from Prairie Point, which is a ranger station up in the Quetico, um, there's two lakes that the height difference is really huge, right? So it makes a waterfall. And it's uh, Louisa Falls. It's on the border of the Louisa Lake and Agnes Lake Agnes. And it, it's, had, it's this waterfall that comes down, makes a big pool, and then comes down again. And there's a campsite that's right next to it. And it has kind of like a sandy beach on it. It's absolutely gorgeous. And I've stayed there probably about 10 times or so uh, over the years. And it's a place I'd like to visit again too because um, I haven't been there in 25 years, 30 years, you know. Um, but it's actually absolutely gorgeous. And it's just the sound of the waterfall at night when you go to sleep is just, I just think it's phenomenal. It's just super peaceful, super chill. I like that a lot. Yeah, that's one of my favorites for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, Terry, thanks so much for talking with us today. If uh, my students want to learn more about what you teach and uh, follow you, where could they follow you or um, learn more? So I have a Instagram. It's IA Woodsman. Or if you just put Terry Barney in there, it comes in. I think I got like 17,000 followers on that one or so. And then I've got my Iowa Woodsman YouTube channel. I haven't done... Um, videos in a while i kind of got burnt out on it i think i have a couple hundred and i started like a long time ago like 10 12 years ago something like that and then the whole youtube thing kind of just got old i don't like i i did it because it was fun and because i you know and because i wanted to get good information out there and i got kind of the whole social media thing anymore to me is kind of a drag you know i um i just don't enjoy it like i used to it's so 
nasty sometimes and there's so many people that are just unhappy people and I feel sorry for them and I and, and I and I don't like surrounding myself with negativity because I just don't think it's good for anybody so um that's not to say that there's not good stuff on there too don't get me wrong but it's just I just don't I just don't like the negativity of, of social media I think it's very divisive and I think it's very especially for young people it's not easy like your guys' age that all you guys are um it, it's not an easy age right it's not you're still figuring out who you want to be and you've got you've got so much going for you you live in a great country you guys have obviously a great teachers right you uh you guys got so much going for you and don't let anybody drag you down don't uh don't t- don't don't think that you have to do what everybody else does i never spent a day in college and and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with college don't get me wrong i'm not saying that but my guidance counselor told me that i should probably not go to college and you know, and I think that he was probably right. I wouldn't have done well in college because I had too much on my mind. I couldn't have concentrated. Now, since then, I've taken tons of classes. And I actually teach at a community college in Omaha. So it's, you know, education is super important, but education comes in a lot of different forms. Um, don't think that you guys have to get into this horrible debt just to live your lives. You can there is so much out there and so much to do and enjoy your youth and, and enjoy your friends and enjoy your family. And don't let the negativity of that social media get you down because it's, it's a poison. I think I really, and like I said, it's rough for kids, your guys' age. It's, it's hard figuring stuff out, but I tell you what, it gets better. Just so you know, it gets better. <laughs> but yeah. So <laughs> awesome thanks so much terry for talking with us we really appreciate it um thanks oh, no for problem. spending your time <clears throat> we'll go ahead and sign off and we will check out your youtube channel and i will keep following your instagram that's how i first uh, oh really heard of you. Mm-hmm. great yeah yeah that's uh yeah more than and you guys uh i i i'll answer questions i don't you got questions Post them up on uh, on Instagram or send me a, a, a DM or whatever, and it, it, it takes me a few days usually because I don't like I said get on it too often. But yeah, ask questions. Um, feel free. I have no problem with that at all. All right. Well, thanks again, Terry. Really appreciate it. All right, guys. Thank you. Have a nice day. Okay. Have a good summer. All right. Bye bye. All right. Bye. Mm-hmm.